What's going on, everybody? It's real with Jordan and Demi. It's the holiday season. We thought we'd do something fun and different. Um, very intellectual show we have for you today. Um, our first guest, we have two guests. Uh, our first guest you may know as the front woman or front demon, as her Instagram bio would, would say, uh -huh. of Speedy Ortiz. And for her solo music, she makes under the name Sad13. She was recently named as one of the 250 greatest guitarists of all time by Rolling Stone, but she's also a writer and the author of two books of poetry. Please welcome Sadie Dupuy. Hello. And joining Sadie is a cartoonist and author, best known for his contributions to The New Yorker. His first book, This Country, is out now, but most important, he's my former co-host on The Voice of the University of Miami, 90.5 WVUM. Please welcome Navid. Medavian. I'm jealous. Hello. That's a nice throwback. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's your former co-host, Jordan? You didn't tell former me Former co-host. did not yeah, Jordan. drama. You've been put on the spot here. Oh, hell no. <laughs> yeah, the ex, the ex is in the house. You have to do a <laughs> co-host <laughs> off. I, I, don't, I don't know if he does the same thing with you, but we weren't allowed to talk in between the shows so that we wouldn't like ruin any potential content. Right, right. You want to keep it fresh. That's why, yeah. because I feel like I frequently get on a podcast with a buddy and we chat for like 10 minutes and we're like, ah, probably should have saved that for when we were taping. Right, right. Yeah. Or well, you say too much. I think, yeah. Me and Victoria, I have a friend, Victoria. She's an actor. We've had her on the show. And we once were like, yeah, you know, we should do a girls podcast. Let's just try it out. And we spent an hour just talking about our deepest, darkest secrets. And I was like, yeah, this isn't going to work. We're going to we're gonna expose ourselves into, you know what I'm saying? So. Yeah. Well, we'll get into the deep, dark secrets later on in the show. Yeah, I'm holding all <laughs> but, those for like minute 30. Right. <laughs> but first, we do want to, we do want to, uh, I do want to note that that uh, um, Navid and Sadie are loosely linked by The New Yorker. Of course, Navid contrib contributes to The New Yorker as a cartoonist and Sadie, an illustration of Sadie, an illustrated version of Sadie was once on the cover of The New Yorker. So there's the loose connection. But the, the purpose of this episode, guys, was to talk about books and your favorite books and that kind of thing. Sadie, I'll start with you because you are the bookworm. You are the queen of stacks on your on your nightstand. You know, that's kind of what you're known for. Um, what did you notice this year in terms of uh, books that you read, trends in literature, that kind of thing? Like, was it a good year for books this year? I'll say this is, it's the most books I'll have read in a single year this year. So I guess that means, and I tend to focus on newer books, not only because I have enough author friends at this point that I'm always like a hundred books behind in the advanced reader copy department, but um, yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll have read probably 130 books by the end of the year. And as someone who doesn't, you know, review books, I'm not a bookseller. Uh, that's, that's quite a lot. Yeah, that's so, that's so I think it was a good year for me at least. Um, and now, how many books did you read? I actually just pulled it up, I have it on my, my notes. I've been keeping track of the books I've been reading. My goal this year, which I thought was ambitious until I heard how many books you read, my, <laughs> my mind was one a week, and I don't, and I definitely have not hit that. I mean, I, I think I've read like 22 books. This year. I, I still think so, I feel like I frequently have friends say. Wow, my goal was much less than that. Now I feel shame. I'm like, no. As long as you re read the amount that you wanted to that year, I think. You, you so what? Like. What? What? I'm, what I'm coming away with this is just don't talk about the number of books you read around saying. <laughs> <you know, laughs> and I know Demi. Demi is more on the nonfiction side. Demi reads more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what Lately, have you read? Yes. Huh? Lately, yes. Yes. What have, what have you been reading, Demi, this year? Oh, my God. Um, okay, so I think, like, I remember my dad taking me to this, like, thrift kind of, like, I'm not sure if it was a thrift store, but when I was growing up, and they always had a bunch of, like, self-help books. So I got really into, like, I don't know, more informative type books when I was really young. I don't know why. But lately... Um, my friend Victoria, again, she had this book called The Seven Husbands of, oh my God, I forgot. I forgot the name of the book, but there's about the what seven. The title? I forgot the title. I literally forgot the title, but it's about the seven husbands of, oh my God. Of, of Evelyn Hugo. Hugo. Evelyn Hugo. Yes. And 
that's been really interesting because it's like role reverse. You know what I'm saying? It's like, you know, girls could do it too. But anyways. Cool. Um, so this is the author of Daisy Jones. I'm reading that. So yes. Okay. I'm actually reading that cool. as well right now because of that book. And I actually don't like it as much as the Seven Husbands books, to be honest. I think it's a little bit. Have you read that one? I haven't. No, yeah. I don't know. Look at there, a book that Sadie hasn't read yet. All right. <laughs> you know, this is the thing. Like, I, I read quite a lot, but it's kind of uh, niche and indie publishers. So I, I don't always, I frequently don't know. If I get a couple of, like, the big names, like, I, I just finished, um, I'm going to butcher her name's pronunciation because I've been saying it wrong for so many years. Uh Alif Batuman, I think, uh, the Turkish American author. She she published a book a couple years ago called The Idiot. Um, obviously a Dostoevsky reference, but it's a really great novel that was like the big <laughs> book a few years ago. I just read it this year. So the idiot. I mean, maybe I read like two two like big novels this year. B big in terms of like bestsellers. Navi and Sadie, you both have written books, published books. How much do you pay attention? I know um, we'll give we'll give uh, Navi props. It's showing up on best end of year lists. Uh, this country is. Oh, yeah. How much do you pay attention to that? Like the way uh, your books are received among the press. Do you care? Like obviously you care because it affects your sales and stuff. But yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I don't know what it's like for other artists, but everything I do, it's just for like attention and i just i just want, like, i want people to like me so i mean like as soon as like even like the goodreads reviews were were coming out like i was i, I mean i still like every other day i'll just like check to see what random people on the internet are saying about it but yeah i mean i think i check way too frequently to see um whether people like like my book i think I'm on, the, I'm on the other side of the spectrum from you and i feel like having music as my primary career has kind of like prepped me to not look at Goodreads. Um, once in a while I do and I kind of laugh. People will be like, this is inaccessible poetry. I'm like, <laughs> and, and, like read Mary Oliver. Like, uh, yeah. but um, I don't know. I try not to put too much Inaccessible poetry. I feel like poetry is inherently like, so what you want it to be as a poet. I don't know. I just, yeah, there's such a range of styles. And yeah. I, I think maybe because some folks come to my book because they know me as a songwriter. They think this will be some easy <laughs> lyrics. Like my books aren't yeah. that easy. Uh, I'm definitely not a good like like first poet or first 10 poets. Um, so I don't really look at Goodreads. And I'm very, as a, as a sometime and former journalist, I am very appreciative of press that I get asked to do and music writing, but I try not to put too much stock into the critical stuff, even though it's like a nice boon when it when it turns out well, because I want to continue making stuff that is in, isn't directed by that kind of outside influence of like uh, attain the highest score. Yeah, <laughs> just not to yeah. say that's not a valid like thing to to worry about, but um, I think I've kind of accepted that all the stuff I work on is sort of in like a cult, like a indie sphere yeah, where it's, like it's not gonna figure. you're an ind a figure the indie community or something yeah, yeah i'm not gonna make a you know a billboard hit so sure one book i want to read though have you are you guys familiar with um wow my brain's crazy today but julia fox julia. oh her new, her new memoir yeah that's something no. i really want to read and i actually found out that spotify has the audio version of it and i I went through like half of chapter one and I was like, I don't want to do that. Like, I want to, I want to feel it. Like I want to read it. Like I feel was, like, was she, did she narrate the audio book? Is Julia Fox? She narrates it. Yeah. That's, See, that's, that's when I think the audio book is what you should opt for. When, when people read their own work, I love isn't that, that cool? on an audio book. Yeah. But yeah. she was a dominatrix for anyone who doesn't know. Uh, she who hasn't been she's a, a lot of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Model, actress, like news, everything. So more than a movie. Yeah, I, I do enjoy a memoir. I, I I remember when I was I did a lot of the David Sedaris audio books, audio recordings when I was you know, um, Navi. We we didn't we kind of glazed over this. Could you explain to the people what your book, This Country, actually is about? Yeah, it's about my time as a dominatrix and then a muse. Um, it's a, it's about my three years that I spent in very rural Idaho. Uh, moved there right after Trump was elected, November 2016. Um, so, like, let's move to the middle of nowhere, said no Middle Eastern American ever, but that's just what I did. And so it, it chronicles those um, 
three years from 2016 to 2019. Um, and all of the shenanigans that uh, I got up to, some of which you might expect moving to like super rural America. Like the nearest town was 20 minutes away and it had 500 people. Oh, the no, county's the wow. size of, I know, yeah. And the county's the size of Connecticut, but only has 4,500 people. So like very- Where, can you like locate me geographically in Idaho? Yeah, like, I, 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 like central Idaho. Okay. Uh, like, do you know Sun Valley or Ketchum? I do, yeah. Okay, yeah, so it's like over the mountain okay. from, from, from there, yeah. Um, you grew up in Mass, Idaho, Idaho in a big, uh, yeah. big circle. Yeah, just in like middle of nowhere in the middle of, of Idaho. Yeah, and it's it's a graphic memoir too. I I, yeah. I don't. Yeah, we should note that it's not a a novel. Um, have you thought about Navid? Have you thought about doing a a straight text book, or is yeah, or is yeah, so but, intrinsically a cartoonist that yeah. I mean, but I feel like that would be like learning a whole new skill. I mean, like when I I mean most of what I read, I don't read that many. I mean, this year I read more. I think just because I had some friends' books who had come out, um, and my book came out. But usually, I don't read graphic novels and memoirs um and so i can really appreciate that people can like describe things with words because like i don't have to i can just like draw the mountains i can just draw a person and i don't have to describe them um so i definitely appreciate people who don't have to draw things um yeah. but i don't know i don't know if i would at some point well we'll wait for it wait for it and sadie have you ever thought about writing fiction instead of poetry or have you written fiction instead of poetry yeah i mean um let's see i, I mean i had to take some fiction courses when i was in an mfa you know a decade ago um and maybe like january two two years ago i did an outline for a novel um which weirdly came out of I don't think I can say for what IP, but I got asked to pitch a graphic novel for um, like a fairly known uh, franchise. Um, the Avengers? I don't think I can say, but it's not The Avengers. Oh, okay. Um, but I liked some of the ideas. It didn't go anywhere. Uh, the editor left. Uh, but I liked some of the ideas I came up with. And I was like, I think I can reconfigure this to a story that does not include well-known characters. So I, I have an outline for a novel, but then we got so sucked into making this album that came out this year and I was on book tour for the last book. Um, I don't even think, I think the last book was like a, at the, in the long wait between turning it in and it getting printed. So uh, maybe that'll be something I can work on next year. Yeah. And would you, would you, would you keep it as a graphic? novel or would you I don't think so out? um just because I'm a such slow I'm so much of a slower collaborator mm -hmm. than I am a go into my hole and work for a lot of hours but when I was a kid I I read tons of graphic novels I, I still read a fair amount and that was sort of my initial medium and I, I liked making comics when I was when I was young uh, it's really strange I tell people my one of my really good friends from uh uh, Navi, knew, I knew from undergrad and grad school. One of my best friends from grad school is Malka Garib from NPR, who mm, yeah, um, who's written who's written two right. graphic novels. Uh -huh. So it's really bizarre that my arguably like two of my best friends from college both became graphic novelists. It's just it's so specific, you know. Um, yeah, I love it. I love it. I mean, a couple. One of my best friends is Michael DeForge. I did a, a bunch of book touring with him last year. Um, so it was like a, a poet and a cartoonist on book tour together. We attract fairly different fan bases, but it was fun to get to go out together for, the, I think that's the second book tour we've done together. Um, but I, I certainly look to graphic novels for inspiration as a poet and a songwriter. Um, yeah. yeah. Tremendous. Yeah. Wait, pause. Because you two went to college together? Me and Navid went to college together. Yeah. So what were you guys like in college? Like, can y'all tell me, like, what's the scoop? Okay. So let, let me, let me, before, I, I'm going to embarrass Navi a little bit. Okay, so <laughs> first of all. You're on the spot now. <laughs> I'm just curious. So first of all, um, Navi has always been the snob that he is today. He's always been that. Um, but he just dresses the part more now than he used to. <laughs> oh um, my God. He used to do uh, ball caps, trucker hats, cargo shorts, 
Um, but, hey, you know me. Yeah, that's the the period I try to. I, yeah, I prefer, but I yeah. Always, you've always done the beard. You've had a beard forever. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, we, we, I've seen Navi play beer pong. Like you would never think that a New Yorker cartoonist would be. What's wrong know. with beer pong? It's a fun <laughs> game. Yeah. Well, you know, if, he's got the sweaters and the, he does the cardigans now, you know, it's, it's, it's got to picture it, you know, it's a little bit different, but all, you know, he's always had, um, opinions, strong opinions on foreign films. Um, yeah, because we actually we we met in a film class, a screenwriting yeah, class. Yeah, we were both film majors. Ah. Yeah. Well, I was I was a film major for one year. I was a, like a different major every year until I finally settled on one in the graduate. Did you actually grade. graduate? What was your actual film? classics and philosophy? So film was my sophomore year. Yeah. Okay. I I was oh, I trained the other there from the school specifically for the film school because okay. I didn't have the grades. Uh, or the ACT, SAT to get into NYU or UCLA. So I was going, and I wanted a big city because I, I was I was from Missouri. I wanted to like go to a big city that had people from different parts of the country, different parts of the world. So that was kind of my thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, but we had to double major because the film department was self aware that like it's hard to become a filmmaker as your career so they made you ma have a second major and mine was creative writing i actually thought about doing the mfa and becoming a novelist or going into like i was a big short story writer at one point um so so that's my background that's and then i did the, i did the the uh student radio station there um and uh and we were wedged in between um there was a bollywood show before us and after us was sports so we were wedged in between Bollywood and I remember that after Netflix. after you left, I had I, I got my own show, but my show was from the one to four in the morning slot, and I think that's where I was. Good slot. Good <laughs> slot, yeah. I definitely had to do the uh, this next song was requested when there were no requests because nobody was listening to my <laughs> show. One a.m. One a.m. Like, yeah, one a.m. One a.m. Oh, wow. Yeah, nice and it was, to catch like, the after hour kids. Yeah, and it was like in this like windowless like box, and mm. so yeah. Spe Speaking of college, now Sadie, you you taught at college before you did music full time, right? Or I mean, I've always played in bands, but I I was um... clear up the Wikipedia page for us. <laughs> oh well, I was born in uh, July of nineteen eighty. Let's go step by um... step, fact check. Yeah, let's see. No, but, uh... So w what was what would your inner why did you, did you always, did you want to be a teacher when you were younger or was it just like, you like talking about literature? Like, how did you get into teaching? I was a graduate student employee. So, um, in order to get, get a free MFA that I could, uh, get a salary to earn you, you taught, uh, you taught undergrads. So that, that was sort of how I wound up doing that. I was pursuing an MFA at, at UMass Amherst for poetry. Yeah. I did um, COM 107 at Syracuse. Common, common well, was introduction to communications. I was the TA. Ah, uh, gotcha, yeah, gotcha, yeah, yeah. gotcha. Yeah. Um, I had kind of a. I mean, I also was a college DJ. Um, I first went to school for math. I was doubling in math and music. Uh, Ooh. and I did that at MIT, and I was there for two years. I realized I hated doing math, at least within that environment. Um, I took some writing classes. This is kind of cool. Uh, what if I what if I drop out? Um, so I dropped out. I was doing freelance music writing uh, for a couple different publications. I wound up going back to school somewhere else with a focus on writing because all the um, magazine jobs I wanted required you to have finished your undergrad. Um, by the time I finished the undergrad, all the magazines I'm applying to are folding or the editors who've thrown me some freelance work and are interviewing me or getting fired in mass. Uh, it's not <laughs> a drastically different climate than it is today, except um, now it's come for all the websites. Um, I basically just got so freaked out by the consistent layoffs I was experiencing, you know, that all my peers were experiencing that were resulting in me scrambling for different freelance work and uh, struggling to get a the full-time editorial job after finishing this undergrad that I thought what what grad programs will pay me to go and have something to do with writing and that's that's how I wound up teaching but but I had uh, taught at a summer camp that was like one of my earliest jobs I taught 
music and writing uh, to younger kids. So I had some experience teaching and, and I really enjoyed it. I learned a lot, especially in the teaching writing context. I feel like you are very much learning from your students as you are sharing what you know. It, it was a really positive yeah. experience and, and one that I have appreciated being able to return to once in a while when a university is like, come for a week, talk to some kids, go through their portfolios. I always really, uh, I'm glad to still have access to that. Yeah, I've actually like looked into kind of casually teaching at a community college in some capacity or like a junior college here in, in LA or something. Yeah, a lot of my friends have been, even in LA actually, a, a couple friends teach music business classes at community colleges and, and I think it's pretty cool. rewarding for them. Yeah, I would want to teach some kind of intro to photography or something. I, uh, cool. I live pretty close to LA Valley College, which sounds like a fake college, but it's actually real. It sounds like a <laughs> fictional like TV college or something, but um, yeah. Uh, Sadie, let's talk about music, speedy stuff. Sure. So it had been a little bit of a gap between speedy albums. You had done some solo stuff. Mm -hmm. So why did you, what made you return to the speedy name and the speedy life? Yeah. I mean, we, we never really took a hiatus or, or planned to pause for as long as we did, but the pandemic kind of happened. <laughs> I feel like uh, I've been getting a lot of, it's been five years. Did you ever think you'd do speedy again? I'm like, yeah, we were always like working on stuff and hanging out and, we just couldn't play for two years. No, nobody did. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, between the last album, I put out two books. I did a solo album. There was a ton of touring on other things. Uh, so it wasn't like I was sitting at home twiddling my thumbs. But you did. I, you did. You did a Sad Thirteen album. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that that came out uh, in the very lucky time of September 2020, um, which meant all the touring didn't happen. That was fine. I was happy to uh, stay safe and keep other people safe. Um, I got, I got a couple nicer microphones so I could do the home recording sessions and performances that the pandemic seemed to require. Um, but it, it's been nice to do this record and get to come back to touring in a more normal way. We were just out for uh, about three months and have a little bit more coming up and then next year. So I feel back on the road. And that's why I can read 130 books a year because I, I don't get car sick. Oh, wow. I can't. Can you read in the car? I can't. Yeah. I don't like reading in the car. That's exactly why I can read so many books because I, you know. Yeah. I can't sit on the computer for, for eight hours a day. Right. Um, in the I car, can read in the subway can... and I can read on a plane, obviously, but like there's something about the moving, the the light coming through the window. I don't know or something. I think your experience is more common than mine. I'm very, very lucky. I feel like I wouldn't tour this much if I couldn't read in the car. Uh, <laughs> I wonder with the artists with like multiple projects, what comes first? Do you like write the song and then you decide this is for this project or do you sit down and say, today I'm going to write for like, speedy or today I'm going to write for like myself. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm kind of like, I'm working on this project in this time frame, mm -hmm. So let me make things that are towards this, whether that's like a book or a record. Um, and there's certainly things, there's a, there's things I wrote for the speedy album that didn't feel correct and I'll hold them aside and maybe they'll be right for an, a sad 13 album, or maybe there'll be a standalone thing, or maybe next speedy album, I'll be into something different and, and rearrange it. Um, all of those outcomes have happened before, but I, I tend to kind of think, you know, I'm not making a mood board, but I have like a sort of a, a concept of what the project is about and, and what will fit it. And um, sometimes you come up with, I mean, I'm sure it's the same for, for all of us. Like you come up with things while you're working on a project that aren't quite right for it, but you still like them anyway. So you put them in a drawer and, and deal with them later. Oh, snap. I feel like indie music is having such a moment right now. Like I feel like for all the OGs that liked love to dig like on SoundCloud or like deep into like YouTube, like for cool, like gems, you know, like coming from bands from places that maybe like, you know, you've never been or whatever, like, like indie music is having this, this big thing right now. And like, there's so many cool artists coming out of that genre. How do you feel about that? Um, and like any kind of new artists that, you know, indie artists that you kind of want to shout out or introduce everybody to? Yeah, I mean, um, a few that we had on tour with us this year, have, they've all been amazing. You know, we, we pick all our uh, support bands, so they're all things we, we feel really passionately about. Mm -hmm. um, Pool Blood uh, did a portion of the tour. They had a record out this year called Mole that's one of my favorites. It's um, the, the front person, Miriam, is inspired by Cat Stevens, but also like... <laughs> 
incubus. <laughs> They're like uh, I like he said incubus underneath your breath. Like I mean, I love that. incubus, but you wouldn't know it. It's very like a interesting folky um, indie arrangement. Uh, but that's some, there's some pretty weird harmonies in there. I'm like, you got a little new metal influence, buddy. Uh, so <laughs> I loved playing with them. Uh, great uh, Toronto-based project. Um, we had Space Moth out with us on this last portion of the tour. Um, another Miriam, weirdly. Uh, she is an amazing producer based in, in the Bay Area. Um, I actually put this record out on the Wax9 imprint that I run, um, but it's like broadcast, stereo lab, indebted, and she's talking about her experiences as a um, first generation Afghan American and uh, pursuing music sort of within her family's culture. It's really interesting lyrically and because she's a synth wizard and production genius, it just sounds so lush and cool. Um, who else did we have out with us this year? Uh, this great band, Foyer Red, that I think, can I, I can swear on this, yeah? Yeah, I absolutely. I think uh, the Pitchfork review was like, fuck you, Crayon Rock was the genre they tagged <laughs> it with. But it, it sounds what like- Crayon um, Rock? Very like playful no wave. It's, it's super cool. Um, the front person is is playing a the front the singer is playing like a clarinet as well. But there's like math rocky proggy aspects of oh, it. Okay. The guitar parts are super cool. So those are at oh, least three, three bands I loved touring with this year. And then uh, two of my favorite records this year. I got to meet the people who made them while we were on tour, which was really exciting. Um, Sweeping Promises, who are an amazing two piece based out of Lawrence, Kansas. It's kind of Post punk, uh, this very well thought out. Um, it, it sounds like it's recorded straight to like a cassette. It's it's very intentional, lo fi, but but uh, 3D production. A little tape hiss going on. Yeah, it's like yeah. if you hear it, the drum sound is just like you, you haven't heard anything like it in, in a few decades. It's really a cool choice. And then this punk band from. Nashville Snooper I got to meet uh, while we were out there and I love their record too. So there's three I know and, and two I don't really know. So well, nice Demi, it wasn't a full episode. You got to check out. No, I'm going to go back to the episode and be like this. <laughs> yeah. What, Navi, what have, you, what have you been listening to? Because I know you're obviously in music. Here's the pressure yeah. where you have to look cool. Like say a cool band. I know, yeah, I know yeah, mine's yeah. easy because I was like, I just saw these people. So they're kind of in my mind. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, all the people who I've been listening to, I have not got to meet in person. Um, I don't know. I'm just thinking about like my my Spotify rap. Um, I think like the the albums that I tend to like listen to something on repeat. And so like one of my mm -hmm. top five songs was I mean like King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard. I love. I mean they're like too prolific, so I, I catch like one out of every six albums. Yeah, they've got like they 40 have, albums or something, right? Yeah, I mean, it's like, it's it's just, it's too many, so like occasionally I'll like catch one and I love it, and then like I'll listen to something off of it, I'll lose, so they have the song Dragon, that's like, I don't know, like this 10 minute, like thrash metal epic song, and I listened to that song, I think like 120 times this year. Um, uh, who else? Um, Billy Martin, I've been, I've been into. I think one of her songs uh, was like my number 11 song. Um, and then I'm also like, I don't know, I'm like a, a, a Lana fan. So I think like her album from this year was, I think like five of the songs was in my like top 10 um, from, from, from this year. What's your favorite uh, Lana album? Um, I mean, I really liked her new one. You know, like Norman fucking Rockwell is good, but then like her new one, yeah. uh, <clears throat> What's it called? With like the black and white, like with the white dress. That no, one? Uh, no, no, no. Um, hold on, let me pull up the name. Did of you it. know there's a tunnel under ocean? That one. Yes. Oh wow. Yeah. Talk to the last. The last song on there was my number one song this year. Taco Truck V. Really? Uh, yeah, XVB. I listened to. I think Spotify told me 142 times this year. This was like it was like oh, wow. on, on. Yeah. And then I've also been listening to. I don't know if you guys know Kino. They're like an old Soviet rock band. They were like one of oh. like the first rock bands in the Soviet Union. To get, That's get the most Bobby reference I've heard today. So yeah, yeah. And they had this one song, Kakushka, which is also one of my like songs that's on on repeat. I don't know if you guys knew this. Are you familiar with uh, bootleg records in the Soviet Union? What they were printed on? No, you no. Know this little, little. So 
Western music was was banned in the Soviet Union, and so they have all these ways of bootlegging stuff. And um, they had, you know, people would like bootleg records, but they needed material to record onto. Mm -hmm. And hospitals had all of these X-rays that they had to get rid of oh, because no. of like safety issues. And so there was like this market where hospitals would get their X-rays to um, bootleggers. And so you have all of like these great like Western albums from the sixties and seventies that are recorded on like albums that have like x-rays of like people's heads and feet and fists so they made they used x-ray film to cut the the grooves yep yeah that's fascinating what? it must have been a, a thicker material back then because i feel yeah, like yeah yeah like here i know I you mean, can like, do like flexi could... discs and and people print on postcards and stuff but usually that's for like a seven inch right yeah, and so here's oh, so like a person's skull. <laughs> yeah, wow. And so, yeah, and so you can like you know you can pick these up on on oh, like eBay. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah, It'd just be cool as wall art That's to so have cool. one of those. Like, yeah, wall. I was just thinking the same thing. You just blew yeah. my mind. Yeah. Wow. Um, speaking of going to high school together, I didn't know her, but I went to high school with Lana Del Rey for one year. Huh. Um, Mm -hmm. you, but you never, you never like cross paths with her. You never like. No, I went to. Um, I'll preface by saying I was a, a scholarship day student uh, at a boarding school for one year. Uh, I did not do very well. I did not get to go back the next year. Um, but Lana Del Rey was a senior at that time, so I, I did not so you know didn't her. Your scholarship? You like lost your scholarship? Yeah, I didn't. I. I <laughs> I went to public school for the rest of the time, and it was a much better environment for me. I went uh, to public school too. You know. <laughs> And Demi but I got one year in. It was an interesting experience, and I at least um, came away with a yearbook with Lana Del Rey in it. Yeah, that I still have yeah. it in my mom's house. Wow! When back when she was Lizzie, back when she was Lizzie, Elizabeth. Yeah. Oh, just full Elizabeth. Full yeah. Elizabeth. Uh, wow. My friend, like the one, there's like I have like two or three friends from that year that I'm still in touch with, uh, and I saw one of them recently. I stayed with her in Dallas, and uh, she was in like a singing group with Lana Del Rey, and said she was she was chill. Oh, cool. Oh, wow. Cool. But it was oh, yeah. a weird environment. It was like a lot of rich kids and they all uh, were constantly getting expelled for doing cocaine. And I was you know, <laughs> a straight edge who commuted an hour to go to school every day. I'm born to die. She talks about like literally like I think she literally said that she was in this kind of like environment like you described for school and they were doing a bunch of drugs and then she got sent away. Yeah, a bunch of kids the senior year when i was a freshman the one year i was there a bunch of the seniors all got expelled at once for doing coke and it was i don't know if she was one but i do know she uh i think she talked about i had like one teacher i liked who was the english teacher and i think i once read an interview where she shouted out the same english teacher so oh, wow. we had to read the bible a lot oh my god i'm jewish <laughs> yeah I, I didn't yeah i totally had the the the, that not was was not my experience at all. Um, it was just the one year, but it was it was memorable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's funny because I'm from this part of Kansas City called Raytown. That's like not the worst part, but it's the kind of part where when you mention you're from, people are like ah, uh, ah. Uh. So, okay, gotcha. Yeah, it's one of that one of those kind of deals. That could mean two things. That could be like that's real nice, or it could be yeah. It's uh -oh. more like a, oh, are you uh, are you in a gang? Was your dad in jail? When you're growing <laughs> yeah. up like that kind of stuff. Navida, I, one thing I, I, you kind of talked about this. I went to see, you know, you're a real author when you do artist talks at bookstores. And Navid was here in LA a few weeks ago uh, doing a book talk for, for, his, for his book. And um, it got me thinking about becoming a pro writer, a professional writer, a professional cartoonist. And you were a, uh, what, elementary school teacher? Is that right? Or yeah. elementary yeah, school teacher? Yeah. Yeah. And you just started like making cartoons one day and said, yeah, I can start selling these to people or like, you know, or did you say like, I need, I need a way to escape these kids. I can draw. Here's my path out. Like what? Yeah. Was the well, I, I think for like a lot of the teachers, I mean, it wasn't the kids like hearing say you talk about like going back and teaching. I just got into do that with writing for the first time. And it was nice being able to like marry like art with teaching. Um, Cause when I was a, elementary school teacher it was just fifth grade all the subjects um so it was on the students it was the administration that i was trying to get away from um but yeah i mean i was always a doodler don't have a background in in the arts and so part of the book moving to idaho was wanting to become an artist being able to own land there is like really cheap 
tiny off that off the grid house. And so like for that year, I like put in like the 10,000 hours and I don't really know why I chose New Yorker cartoons as like the medium of expression. Um, but I just like did that for a year and then like almost a year to the day I went to New York to the New Yorker office and back then before the pandemic, anybody could come in on a Tuesday and meet with the humor editor and it was neat. You'd like to put your name on a, a sign up sheet and you go sit in a room and there were like, you know, like the, the old guys who have been doing this for like 50 years and then like newbies who wanted to, um, break into cartooning and then you get to meet with the humor editor and I was able to sell a cartoon. Luckily that first um meeting um which i think is unusual but the, the the new humor editor emma allen she had been on the job for like six months and she's been doing a lot to try to bring in like new diverse voices so uh where before that you had to like do it like consistently for six months before they would even um uh consider buying a cartoon cartoon from you but yeah like no 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 background and um and yeah and i've been doing it ever ever since and you and you made it. You made it. I made I made it. Making 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 the big bucks now. <laughs> what's, what's, are you working on on book number two? Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, I'm also I'm working on book number two. I'm trying to trying to figure. What do you do air quotes for working on book number two? Like, what? That's the thing is, yeah. like, I mean, I'm looking at right now. I have this window open, and in the back there's like the the slew of tabs that I keep the new docs that I keep opening up. Where I'm like, this is where I'm really going to put my thoughts in for the for the new book and I try reorganizing what I've written into, into something for, for the proposal. Um, but I don't, I mean, I don't know what it's like for, for, for poetry, but for, um, for the, the last book I had, I knew what like the beginning was, I knew what the ending was. And then I knew what all like the beats in the middle were going to be. And then I just had to figure out like how to tell that story. But for this one, it's also memoir, but then a bit like more amorphous. And so trying to like nail down like, well, what is the, you know, like, what's the arc? What's the story? What's the conflict is proving to be a little bit, a little bit harder. Yeah. One thing I, I it was funny to me was that your first, you, the book out now was originally mostly focused on your parents' immigration story from Iran to the U S and instead you made it about yourself. <laughs> and, and what's funny is like, if I had done it with my parents, they wouldn't have cared. They'd have been like, yeah, it's great. You told your story. But like you said, your parents were actually a little peeved that they got cut out of this. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. And then they both asked for the book to be independently dedicated to them. And then they just got an acknowledgement in the, in the back. But yeah, initially it was supposed to be about them. And then I was like, you know what's more compelling than the story of two Iranian kids in exile from their home country? Moving to Idaho on a romantic way. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, but yeah, I, I had spoken to a friend of mine, another cartoonist and writer, Amy Kurzweil, um, when I was thinking of and sketching out what that story about my parents would be. And she was like, well, where are you in this story? People are going to want your perspective. And I think it makes sense. Um, and there are lots of stories. I mean, like Persepolis comes to mind, right? Stories of, you know, Iranian immigrants, um, but they're told from the usually from the perspective of the, the person that I don't show up for like seven years after that story begins. So it made sense to uh, like focus on me, but I still do get to some of those themes in the book. I mean, it's not as like, you know, serious as being in exile, you know, but there, 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 there is still the like being an Iranian immigrant in this new place, uh, conservative, like people, culture shock, um, and so even though it's not about them, I still, I think, got to some of the same, same themes. And they do still make an appearance in the, in the book. Made a cameo. Well, it's funny. I was actually um, a page, a section of Malika Garib's first book, and I got cut out of my <laughs> section got cut out. Because um, I, I went to her, I went to celebrate Christmas with her one year, uh, Filipino style. So I did a Filipino Christmas with her and she did a whole, like a page or something about when she brought her white friend Jordan to Filipino Christmas. Uh, but it didn't make, didn't make the final cut. Um, I mean, that's, that's actually how I describe you to everyone. Also my white friend, Jordan, <laughs> my white friend, Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, um, Sadie, we, I, I do, I do want to ask about the greatest guitarist thing. What was your reaction when you made the list? Did you know it was coming? Was it a surprise? Tell me about that. 
Yeah, I mean, I didn't know it was happening until uh, someone tagged me in it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> someone tagged um, you, that's how you knew. <laughs> uh, yes. So, uh, you know, I have a similar reaction to that as I do the, the other things we were talking about, you know, re reviews and other year-end lists and other forms of group edited lists where I'm grateful that you know someone individually thought it'd be cool to put me on there and I, I definitely appreciate it seems like the mission of this list was to it's more diverse than it usually is diversify not only the kinds of players but the styles of playing that make a great eras game. I felt like they were more and eras yeah yeah and there's plenty of guitarists on there who are not as like quote unquote technical in like a conservatory setting uh I feel like I, I align a little bit more towards the like music theory background. There's a lot of guitarists that are more experimental self-taught on the list, which I think is really cool and opens up the instrument to a lot more kinds of playing being perceived as, um, you know, powerful and, and proficient. Um, but yeah, I, I was grateful to see like the overall changes that were made to that kind of list. Cause it, it tended to be, Older guys, uh, guys, white 60s guys. 60s and 70s uh, yeah. era, yeah. I so think to be on a list with, you know, uh, so many of the the women who inspired me on guitar, Mary Timoney, for example, Liz Fair, um, to see some of my contemporaries and friends on the list, you know, Elle Kemner of Palehound, Brittany Howard, um, PJ Harvey. Like, I feel like wow. her guitar playing is not spoken about, but it's really interesting, um, you know, people using the guitar as a compositional tool rather than like as an athletic tool. And uh, also like the rhythm cool. guitarists, primarily rhythm guitarists, do they deserve to be on there even though they can't shred, you know? I mean, they probably can't, they, they maybe can. And that's just not, I say this is someone who doesn't really play rhythm guitar, but uh, you know, plenty of rhythm guitarists <laughs> can absolutely shred, you know, uh, that's just not the, the function they're playing and the, the project they're known for. So I, I thought that was a really cool endeavor. Um, I don't take a ton of stock in it personally. Cause I'm just like, Oh, cool. Like, uh, I see, you know, I, I bet I can guess who put me on this list. That's awesome that they like it. It means about as much to me, uh, as like when, a. am going to say something that means a lot to me. Um, when we play a show and I meet like a teenager and they say, this show tonight makes me want to start a band or you came through here two years ago and now I'm in a band and maybe we can open for you next time. Um, that's like a really meaningful thing to me that, that someone saw my style as something that, that, empower them to work on something and and that that means a lot to me and it means about the same as being on a list like this because it means someone saw my style and thought it was cool and it meant something to them um i don't really the canonization of stuff like that is like so arbitrary and gets yeah I, I, knew, I, knew, I know lists are kind of arbitrary but i yeah. think specifically the rolling stone list the best albums list and best guitarist lists are kind of like standardish kind of and and what i'll say is i hear a lot from family members that i don't hear from very often when i make it onto lists like that so i'm <laughs> i'm hearing from all kinds of family members i haven't heard from in, a, in quite new a family years. members uh, new family members uh, <laughs> hey i got this investment opportunity people think you're rich all of a sudden <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah, you get on a Rolling Stone list. It comes with a bonus, right? Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, I do want to. I Dimmy Dimmy doesn't like to talk that much about her own music on this show, but but I do appreciate Dimmy's guitar playing. I she Dimmy does a cool like percussive thing, like the kind of slit style, like chick -a -chick, like the word, cool. you know, like. And so I like I appreciate that, you know, because because when Dimmy Dimmy came up in a trio, bass, guitar, drums, there was no rhythm, there was no lead, so mm -hmm. had to do both, you know. Uh, but yeah. All oh, right. Also says that you're a like guitar pedal kind of like wizard. Mm, if you'd come in this room, come in this room, you guys aren't in my house. Uh, if you'd seen this room yesterday, all I've acquired a lot of guitar pedals in the last year because I've been on tour and someone comes to the show and is like, I made this crazy pedal. Like, will you oh, try? No. I'm like, I can't put it on my board on tour, but I will when I get home. So I laid them all out on the table yesterday. I keep all the boxes. I'm like a weird. Oh, wow. I, I have, <laughs> I, I'm not like kind of OCD. I'm like, I have diagnosed OCD my entire life, but I've got a lot of very particular like things. That, Do I what? If you could pick three of them that like for the rest of your life, I mean, I probably boring pedals because the stuff on my board is like has to be just uh, useful for as many songs as possible to, you know, play for an hour plus every day. But the, some of the ones I got are like a little weirder and I'm excited to 
mess with. Um, someone from Alexander Pedals came to the the show we played in Durham, a uh, classic queer rock venue called the Pin Hook. Shout out to the Pin Hook. Um, look up who's playing at the Pin Hook. It'll be all your new favorite bands. Um, but the guy who makes the Alexander Pedals came to the show and had us all test them out. <laughs> Every single one is doing some weird, it's a delay that is oscillating in time. And also the pitch is unattached to that. You're just making outer space laser sounds in a very melodic way. So those are the things I'm excited to like, I can't use that on the road, uh, but I can use that at home. I can run a synth through it and see what happens and, and get a little experimental. So How many Alexander pedals do you have on cool. stage with you? Um, my board fits 12. And do you, and during the course of a show, how many do you actually, do you use all 12? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I'd be, I mean, I'd be, I'd be throwing out my back for nothing if I put pedals <laughs> on there I'm not using. Yeah. Oh my. Demi, what, how many pedals do you play? Do you play, do you just have? No joke, you guys. Like I did make an attempt, I think about a few years ago to like put together a pedal board. You know, everyone has that first kind of like, I made a pedal board, you know, like mm -hmm. stick it on there and all that. But the only thing, I think the only thing that I actually really need or use or like, I don't know, I'm not very like, I'm not too specific other than with a distortion. So like just a rap pedal is, mm -hmm. is all that I use, honestly. And then like the amp of whatever place you're playing at has whatever reverb, but just a rap pedal. I was going to ask you too, like if you had to put, like pick one distortion pedal, what would it be? Because there's so many ones, but I feel like there's nothing like the rap. Yeah, I like um, I like a tube screamer style overdrive. So I I've had like a litany of different ones. Uh, the one that keeps coming up for me, and that I'm lucky that I I work with them uh, as an artist. So they've been able to. It's like a long out of stock pedal that Earthquaker Devices makes. Um, I think they actually maybe just did some limited edition ones. It's been discontinued for a few years, but it's called a Dunes. Uh, it's like a TS808 style overdrive. It's like a little bit transparent, but it's got nice grit. Uh, I feel like it really lets solos cut through, um, especially, you know, we're a loud band. It's a four piece. Everyone's doing kind of different things. And I want to make sure the the guitar parts that I'm playing are frequently like the hook of that section. I got to make sure that they can cut through. So mm -hmm. I like I like that Dunes pedal. They make um one called the Palisades. It's two of those that uh, is kind of fun as well if you want to go wild i mean i i use like three or four drives on my board any given tour oh, um but wow. that's kind of my like go-to when i'm recording if i know that i want the the solo dialed in a particular way that like quote unquote sounds like me that's kind of my my pedal <laughs> all right i actually, play play have one, I, I actually only have one guitar pedal and it's a rat I was just like, like happily listening and I was like, I have no in on this conversation. And then I was like, there it is. The rat. Oh my God. Yeah. Why? Why that one? Um, I don't know. I think it was, it, I, I think I got it when I was in like early high school, when I was in my callback, my new metal phase. Yeah. And, I was like, <laughs> and I've had it. Yeah. I've had it ever since, but it's the, yeah, the only, only pedal that I, um, yeah, I probably found it on some like early like internet uh, message board, and that was like the one that was recommended. That's a so, classic. Oh my god! Yeah. My. All right. That well, we've awesome. learned so much today about pedals. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, and, the closet that is right behind this hourglass is yeah. just filled with guitar. But that's my my pedal closet. guitar pedal closet. Oh, whole thing. Oh so god. that's what they were all on the table, so I could get them like reorganized. Wow. Can, can, can I can I ask a question? I'm like that with nail polishes, by the way. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I swear. I swear. Yeah, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead yeah, yeah, well, I, I'm interested because like with with like cartooning and like writing, I mean my like toolkit, Jordan was joking that I have a four thousand dollar pen, but I mean like it's like I mean I don't. I mean like everything <laughs> I use, I mean it's it's paper, India ink, and like pens and, and brushes. Yeah. But like yeah. the 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 tools never influence like the message, like what I'm saying. And I'm wondering like when you're writing your songs, do you write it and then figure out like what pedals like make sense in order to like express that? Or do you sometimes start with like, I really want to use this sound mm -hmm. and then craft something around it? It's like, they're kind of simultaneous. Uh, I tend to do lyrics last, but I sort of know what the song is about. I have the 
chord changes. I have the melody. Um, I'd start with like, like I feel like other instruments kind of inform the tone more than the pedals. Like I, I start with drums generally. So I kind of yeah. know what the rhythm is doing. I, I'll put bass in after that. So knowing what the rhythm section is doing, I think tells you a lot about like what kind of story you can be telling or what kind of words you can be using. The, the rhythm and the pacing dictates so much. So after that, the I kind of get into the, the more um, tonified zones of like guitar and synths. And I don't always run stuff through pedals right away. I, I frequently just go like direct into the computer and then run stuff through pedals later. So I'm not like committing to if I'm committing to something in the moment, I'm, I'm inclined to line up like my 10 weirdest pedals and make something that no one here can tell what the melody is other than, than me. Uh, so it's good for me to like reamp stuff later through the tone stuff so I can kind of not be committed forever. Um, but I think some of those ideas do sort of inform what, what lyrics can do. So they're all happening together, I'd say. But once you get the drums and bass and you kind of know, you got a sense the the mood, so much mood comes from drums, I think. At least for me as a listener and, and writer. Yeah. yeah. Cool. But it's um, not all like fancy shit. Like sometimes my, my cheapest pedals are the thing that's like, you know, you go through one fuzz pedal and that's your bass tone. And it sounds awesome. I feel now I want to like learn how to play guitar after oh this. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of feel left out now. Yeah. That's okay. I'm that's rooting okay. for you. <laughs> all right, guys. Well, thank you so much, both of you guys, for joining me on the show. This is been really fun for me and I'm sure it's been fun for Demi, something different, something new. Um, happy holidays to everyone out there, whatever you celebrate, just enjoy their friends and family around you and, uh, check out Sadie's, the new speedy album, check out, uh, Navid's book, this country and whatever, uh, video or, or, uh, song Demi has going on. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for watching and listening to show this entire year. As always, go to popdust.com for the latest in pop culture and music news. Follow me on Instagram at Jordan Edwards Studio. Follow Demi at Demi underscore Ramos. We'll see you next year. <laughs>